Yat e bene. Good morning, my relatives. Are you a person of color? Are you a woman? Are you someone from the LGBTQ plus community? Are you from some other demographic that is on the fringes of our society, the margins of our society? And have you ever sought help from the self-help industry? Maybe you bought a book on how to increase your productivity. You attended a seminar on how to achieve more success at work. Or you downloaded a webinar about how to live healthier and eat healthier. And the more you got into the content, the deeper you dug, the more you realized they're not talking to me, right? They're telling me that if I just believe hard enough, if I just work hard enough, if I just think positively enough, and if I just follow these steps, I can achieve whatever it is I want to achieve. But we live on the margins, right? We know that there are some very real, systemic, and institutional obstacles that are standing between us and us attaining the goals we're often trying to reach. If you've ever felt this way, then this episode of my podcast is for you. Today, I'm going to be discussing a book I've been reading called The 5 a.m. Club. And I'm going to be talking about the toxic positivity that the self-help industry uses to simplify our problems and offer very shallow solutions. My name is Mark Charles. I'm a dual citizen of the United States and the Navajo Nation. And a couple times a week, I like to sit down over my second cup of coffee and have a discussion. I am on a journey to decolonize my faith. I am working hard to build a nation where we the people actually means all the people. I ran for president as an independent candidate in 2020. I am working to try to create a common memory so that we might learn to have a healthier community. In my Navajo tradition, we would say, I am trying to walk in beauty. And I invite you to join me. Today, we're gonna to be discussing toxic positivity as we work to try and understand these things so that we all might know how to walk in beauty together. Thanks for being here. Yate hey, Bene. Good morning, my relatives. This is Mark Charles. Today is Tuesday, March 26. I'm here with my second cup of coffee in my uh, famous Bluebird flower mug. Um, I want to acknowledge, as I always do, that I'm speaking to you from Washington, D.C., and these are the lands of the Piscataway. And I want to honor the Piscataway as the host of the lands where I'm living. I want to thank the Piscataway for the stewardship of these lands. And I want to just state how humbled I am to be living on these lands today. If you are interested in knowing whose lands you are living on, I want to share with you a link. And this is a link I use fairly frequently. I've shared it out on this uh, on my podcast or my 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 show here pretty frequently, but I'm going to give it again for those of you who have never seen it or haven't used it, especially if you're here for the first time. Native-land.ca is the website I use. It's not the final authority on indigenous lands, but it's a great place to begin your research. If you want to know whose lands are you living on, whose lands are you traveling to, whose lands are you working on, you can enter in a zip code, a city, a town, a state, uh, I mean, a country, and you can get a, a, at least a place to start your research with the indigenous nations and peoples of lands throughout most of Turtle Island and even some parts of the, of the rest of the world. So anyway, that's a great resource I want to I want to share with you. I see Mr. Phil Fox is on this morning. Yeah, day, Phil. Great to see you. Thanks for joining. Um, I appreciate you being here and thanks for the tip. Yeah, if you like the show um, and you like uh, what I'm doing here, uh, smash, as Mr. Phil Fox says, smash the like button and subscribe to my channel and feel free to share it out. So thanks, Phil, for that tip. And it's great to have you and other people on with me this morning. So, um, yeah, let's talk about self-help books. <laughs> and... Ever since I've discovered, not discovered, ever since I've uh, began using, I don't like using the word discover, but ever since I began using um, uh, Audible as a way to read and digest and consume more books, I have been going through books like nothing, um, like I've never done before. I'm actually reading usually two or three books at a time. By reading, I mean listening to. 
and I've been able to go through a lot of different books. I've, I've read books about wealth. I've read books about um, uh, productivity. I've read books about um, history. I've read books about, I've shared some of those books with you here on uh, social media. I'm actually do a lot of reading just for pleasure. I'm actually reading right now through the Dune series as the new Dune movie just came out and I'm reading the Dune. Uh, I'm going through the entire Dune series right now. And so I find myself listening to reading a lot of books and some of them I talk about here, but there's a lot of them I, I don't talk about because I, I oftentimes am not sure fully where to go with it, but they all have some exciting things that I want to bring up and mention. And there's a book I've been reading recently. I just finished it a, a few days ago, and I thought I should do an episode on this at some point. But the problem is, is whenever I do an episode on a book like that, I always try to get way too into it and I go get way in depth on it. And I don't just talk about my responses, my reactions and my thoughts about the book. And so I want to do that today. The book I've been reading is it, it is a self-help book um, and it's called The 5 a.m. Club. It's by an author whose name is and let me give you his name. His name is uh, Robin Sh Sh Sharma, and it's an interesting book. The, the title came across one of my social news feeds the other day. It might have been an ad on a news website I was reading. I forget, but the, I, there was something about the 5 a.m. club, and it caught my eye because I'm very much a morning person, and I've been getting up early for a lot of my adult, all of most of my life, I've, I've been a morning person. I love getting up early. Um, I, as you know, I'd like to go out and watch the sunrise. I began doing that when I was back living on the Navajo Nation. I began to kind of follow the traditions of my people and waking up in the morning and greeting the sunrise with my prayers. And that, as you've heard me say, has been a very transformative part of my life. And yet I also, I've worked from home. I have not worked in an office as a full-time employee for almost 25 years now, I think is the last time I held. It was the late 90s, early 2000s, when I held my last full-time job um, in an office. And so I've been working from home and I'm constantly looking and reevaluating and tweaking with my schedule because I'm always trying to find a way to how can I be more productive with my day? Um, I'm an extrovert and I love interacting with people. I love the water cooler conversations, right? Just the, the, the small conversations you have when you walk into an office, when you greet your fellow employees, the banter you have back and forth at different times throughout the day, the short conversations you have when you walk by someone's cubicle. I, I love that part of working in an office and I really miss that. And it gives my brain a great break from kind of the concentration and the focus that I'm doing in my work and then to have those. And I don't get that when I'm home. And so I've tried a lot of different things and I've, I've tried to rearrange my, my work schedule and I've, I've do a lot of tweaking. In fact, I've spent hours just sitting um, in, in a chair or sitting at a desk in front of my computer, looking at my schedule, trying to figure out how I can make myself more productive. Um, even though I'm working from home and I'm working from the same space that I've been, uh, I've been, I'm living in. And so when I saw the the title, the 5 a.m. club, come across my screen, and it, it, I, I think the the subtitle was um, "Elevate Your Life, uh, Own Your Morning, Elevate Your Life." And there was some little comment on that that said something about increasing productivity, and I thought okay, I wouldn't normally read one of those types of self-help books, but I'll look at it. So I, I Googled it. I found it on Amazon. And the reviews were interesting because the reviews basically said, this is a very cheesy book. <laughs> one guy said, I gave it a five stars, but if you, if you, entail, if you include the story that the book is, is it's, it's a story, it actually deserves to have a star taken away because it's such a cheesy story. And people said they love the book. They love the content of the book, but they really kind of rolled their eyes at the story the book is kind of encapsulated in. 
And so I, I, I decided to buy the book. I found it on Audible. I downloaded it and I thought, well, I'll still try it. I'll still try it. And so I went in knowing I was going to be wading through a bunch of cheese to get to maybe some, some helpful things. And it was, it was completely cheesy. The way I described it to my wife is I said, think about if you went to a lecture, right? Maybe it was a, it was a, a, a real scientific lecture or not even like you took a class on chemistry or physics or some other thing, or maybe you took one of those, those underwater basket weaving classes, right? Those classes that satisfy um, a, a requirement to graduate, but you don't really need it. And people take it. Like I had a college class like that at UCLA. It was called atmospheric sciences. A lot of non-science people took the class because it gave you a lab when you didn't actually have a lab. And the professor who taught the class knew that there was a lot of people who were just there for the course or for the, for the credit and weren't that interested in atmospheric sciences. And he even acknowledged the beginning of the course. He said, yeah, the, the most value you're going to get out of my class is it's going to give you things to talk about at cocktail parties. <laughs> and so it, at, right, it went in depth into atmospheric sciences and clouds and all these other things. And I still remember a lot of that knowledge today. But I've never used it except for some trivial uh, facts and comments I've made in conversations or when I'm with people kind of discussing things, the weather around us and so on. And, and so, so imagine you even have a class like that, that covers a lot of material, has a lot of scientific facts, but it's cheesy and there's maybe one or two real gems in there like, oh, I never knew that before. I never understood that. So imagine you took that class. And then in your literature class, your English class, you were given the assignment, or even let's just say the final for that class, right? The final for that class was you had to take all of the information you got in that class and encapsulate it in a fictionous, a fictitious story that you had to write. Now, if you did that, Either your story would be amazing and you would skimp on the details of the class or you would put all the content from the class in there and your story would be really cheesy, right? It would be hard to have both, a really good story as well as a really good um, uh, sharing of the information from the class. And I think that's how I would describe this book, right? It, it there's, there's a few real gems in the book, like things I, I'm like, wow, that's actually really eye-opening and really informative and helpful. But the story is so unbelievably cheesy and the, the, the way it's framed is just so, it makes me, it, I was rolling my eyes numerous times throughout it. And the way I even described this to some people, I said, yeah, reading this book, um, 25% of the book is just stuff I, I, I wouldn't even give the time of day. It was just, it was, it was just fluff. 25% was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, I don't know fully where you got that information, but it sounds intriguing and I'll think about that. And then maybe um, 50 might be too large now that I've read the whole book because I was describing this when I was reading it. So it might be 30, 30, 30. Um, 33, 33, 33. And the other third of the book was like, yeah, this is actually really valuable information. Um, and as I'm reading the book, especially as I'm going through the book and the 5 a.m. club, right? It's about waking up early and having kind of a schedule early in the morning that gives you the energy and the focus and the productivity you need throughout the day, right? That's the basic premise of the book, of the story. Um, and, uh, and as I was reading through the book, for most of it, I was like, this is all stuff I know, right? These are things I've already understood. I've always woken up early. I always knew my most productive and focused time of the day was early in the morning, even before my family members got up. And if I really wanted to have a productive day, I had to get up and start working early, um, I, I, for years, I was, when I was a coach back, um, back in, uh, Gallup, New Mexico, and I was waking up every morning playing basketball 
for three mornings a week and I was out getting exercise and I was, I was, I knew the value of that. And then on the reservation, I was waking up in the morning and walking up the hill and watching the sunrise and reading the sunrise with my prayers. And these are all the things that the book is advocating. Like it basically it says, wake up in the morning. And the first thing you do is take, take 20 minutes and exercise until you sweat, like exercise, not just something light, but exercise vigorously until you sweat. And then take 20 minutes to journal and think about the day the, that just happened. Think about the day that is ahead. What are your goals? What are you what what are you going to improve on? Um, even take some time to reflect and, and give some gratitude and what are things you're thankful for. And then the third was take 20 minutes to learn something and, and really try to learn something new every day. And again, these are not things I haven't been doing. These are not things that haven't been components of my life. And I knew the value of each of these things. Now, the part of the book that made me roll my eyes is the book, the story of the book is, I mean, I'll give you the characters. And I don't even know if we know the names of the characters. There's four characters primarily in this book. There's the billionaire, the entrepreneur, the artist, and the spellbinder. Oh, as a Navajo man, I can't tell you how much that hurts me, right? I mean, this book is absolutely written to white Americans, right? It's it's uh, the, 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 one of the gurus of the book is the billionaire who's obviously achieved not just massive financial success, but is living this amazing um, life of just balance and harmony and peace and so on and so forth. And he's sharing his, his understanding with an entrepreneur and an artist and while he's sharing with him, they fall in love and they get married and he gives them this amazing wedding. And then, of course, the billionaire has been mentored by the spellbinder, who's this very mystic figure who is just has this great wisdom and has researched these things for dozens of years and knows all these great truths and right that he's the true guru of this entire thing and if you if you just wake up at 5 a.m and do these things and, and work on these things then you too can become a billionaire and you too can be at the top of your game and everything and right it's this literally is the story and it never even gives them their it, it never doesn't even introduce who these people are right i mean this is the problem right when in 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 native culture when you introduce yourself you talk about your family who your relationships are where you come from who your people are and and you un, and this and if you introduce yourself in the broad united states you give your your you give your profession right and so to have these four characters who are identified primarily as a billionaire an entrepreneur an artist and a spellbinder it's just like ah you never even get to know these people and so anyway there there's so many things about this book that absolutely made me roll my eyes and then there were huge parts of it where it's like yeah these are things that i already know I already, I already understand. These are things I actually gained from my own tradition, right? My Navajo people taught me this, the value of waking up early in the morning, the value of, 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 of running to see the sunrise, the value of greeting the sunrise with your prayers and being in the state of prayer and reflection and gratitude, right? And the, 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 all of these things, these are things that were taught to me living on the reservation and values I picked up. Now, what made this book, the, the gems that I found in this book, is it, it kind of gave a formula, right? It basically said, wake up at 5 a.m. and immediately, within 10 or 15 minutes, go into vigorous exercise and make yourself sweat, like literally break a sweat. And then transition from that into, into journaling and then after you journal for 20 minutes, then go directly into um, go directly into learning something new every day. And they uh, right they 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 preach that this is what you do every morning. Wake up at 5 a.m. and if you do this, you will prosper and you will thrive and you will have all the money you want and all the honor you want and everything else. And, and those are the promises. And I wasn't going for that. I was looking for a way to be more productive. And so I've had values for all of these components and I've used all of these components. 
but I haven't used that in the order. And so I decided I was going to try it. But I decided I was going to tweak it a little bit because I've known, right, this past year, I've been focusing a lot of my energy on getting more sleep. And not only am I a morning person, I'm also an extrovert who can't go to bed until everyone around me is asleep. And so I need kind of the downtime to kind of wind down my day. And so I usually end up staying up later than I usually like to. And I've been slowly trying to get to bed a bit earlier, but I'm also... Uh, see the value of not waking up every morning because of the way that my daughter's school schedule works right now. I can't watch the sunrise most mornings because I don't have time to get there and come back and still get them to school on time. And so I'm watching the sunrise maybe once a week, maybe even once every other week, depending on the weather, as well as depending on, you know, it's the weekend when I can do it the most. And I've actually been able to get more sleep because I haven't been waking up at the crack of dawn every morning. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'm not going to get up at 5 a.m. because I know from doing this for 20 years of my life, that's only going to diminish my sleep. But I did decide I'm going to follow this schedule for the first, the first hour that I'm awake or the first, these are going to be the first primary things I do each morning in, in also in the midst of the other duties that I have. So, so I woke up and the thing I can control the most is I wake up. And then I go down and I get on our elliptical and I bike and then I walk and then I run and then I bike and then I, I, I walk and then I bike again. I do that for um, 15 to 20 minutes. And I've been breaking a sweat. I've been doing this for a week now and I break a sweat every morning. And then usually at that point, I have to take my daughter to school. So I, I run her to school and back. It takes me about 15 minutes. I come back and then I have another almost 45 minutes to bring my, my other daughter to school. So then I take that time to journal. And I journal and I, I think about the day and the day that passed and the day ahead. I take time to, to just have some gratitude in there. And then I take my other daughter to school and I, I drop her off and come back. And then I, I grab my stuff and I start walking to my office. And then while I'm walking to my office, I usually listen on my headphones to a podcast that literally teaches me something new every day. It's, it's a podcast called Everything Everywhere. I don't have the link on me right now, but I will share it in the notes of this show um, on my YouTube channel and on the podcast so you can find it there. Um, it's called Everything Everywhere. It's about a 15, 20 minute podcast. And it literally it teaches you something new every day, something new about history, something new about science. It's a fascinating, it's a 15, 20 minute in-depth dive on something, not really, really deep, but it goes in depth and you can really learn something new every day. And I've been doing this for a week. And after, literally after two or three days, I said to Rachel, I said, this is amazing. I, I don't know what's different, but not only do I feel more focused and more productive throughout the day, but I feel better. I'm sleeping better and I'm actually, I'm feeling less stressed. I'm feeling less anxious about things. And I was like, I, and I said to Rachel, I said, there must be something about waking up and sweating that is really, really helpful because that's, to be honest, that's the one thing I haven't done in almost 20 years. It was the early 2000s when I was waking up every morning and three mornings a week and playing basketball first thing in the day. Since then, I haven't played basketball much and most of my exercise has been walking, which doesn't entail sweating. And even though I do that fairly frequently, it's not been the first thing I do every morning. And so the, the biggest change I made was I was waking up every morning and vigorously exercising enough to break a sweat. And I said to Rachel, I said, there's something about breaking a sweat early in the morning that is actually really, really helpful. And so I did some research and I, I looked at a few things. I, I want to share some stuff that I learned. And so this is an article I found. I just Googled this. And it's on a, a company's website. I think it's some healthcare company or something. It's called uh, Total Well Wellness Health. And the article is titled Benefits of Breaking a Sweat in the Early Morning. And just summarizing this article, 
It says, if you wake up and you break a sweat early in the morning, you will have more energy. Morning workouts are one of the best ways to feel energized and prepare for the day. In fact, a morning workout might even give you more energy than a cup of coffee. Second, it said, it's going to improve your mood. You'll have a better mood. Waking up a breaking early morning sweat will reward you with a rush of endorphins, uh, serotonins, and dopamine, feel-good chemicals that will boost your mood and help zap stress. Third, it's going to improve your sleep. Exercise in general is known to promote better sleeping habits. Um, in, if you exercise in the evening, though, it makes it hard to fall asleep because your, your body is, is kind of getting revved up. Uh, one study found that participants who exercised at 7 a.m. experienced deeper, longer sleep than those who exercise in the afternoon or evenings. Um, it said you'll get lower blood pressure. A study found that early morning exercise is best for is, is good for reducing blood pressure. Um, it says you'll have less stress. Breaking a stress, breaking a sweat um, before work will lower your body's cortisol levels, which is the stress hormone. And, and so it gave a lot of really tip, a, a really scientific kind of studies that these, this is actually what happens to your body when you break a sweat. And it's not just that article. I, I read several other articles. Here's an article in a blog from someone called Wellness Mama. <laughs> and basically they say pretty much the same thing. Yeah, breaking a sweat early in the morning is, is really good. And then I looked up uh, about journaling, right? So what's the benefit of journaling? And I found several articles about that. And it also said journaling will do a lot to reduce your stress. Journaling will actually help sort through your emotions and through your, your thoughts and ideas and will help you put things aside so you can focus better more throughout the day. Um, and so I'm just putting a bunch of these articles and blog posts that I read that talk about the benefits of journaling. Um, and then I looked up, uh, how about learning something new? And sure enough, there's all these health benefits. And I'll, I, I, one of them I found was a blog called now, Nowadays. Nowadays um, and they had five ways learning something new benefits your mental health. And so I'm going to share this. So anyway, the, the point of all this is, and for me, the, the, the biggest one was breaking of the sweat early in the morning because I literally haven't done that in almost 24 years. 23, 24 years. And I found this week, the, the way I described it, and I noticed it, too, if I'm going to be honest, I noticed it the most when I was driving, where I've adapted some of the patterns of the DC drivers, whereas you don't like to wait, you honk at people who are not turning at red lights or who are staring at their cell phones, and you, you kind of get, it, it, you're not, fully stressed, but you're not completely relaxed and you're, you're in a hurry to get where you're trying to go. And I'll be honest, I've adapted some of those uh, attitudes as I drive. And one of the things I said to Rachel is I even I was evaluating my driving mo mood after I started exercising first thing in the morning. And I said, first of all, I do feel less agitated when I'm behind the wheel. Like I feel less less tense. And second, I think the thing I feel even more than that is I feel a greater sense of impulse control. Because I said there's been several times where I've had the impulse to honk at somebody, right? They're waiting too long at a, at a, at a light to turn or they're, they're, you can tell they're looking at their phone and right, you're, you're like, you're, I felt the impulse to honk at them. And I, but I've had better control of that. And so it's, it's been fascinating to, to think through and then even to just read some of these blogs about, yeah, this is what's actually going on in your body. And then the other thing, some other tips that came out of this book, there was a fairly good section on sleep. And there was a fairly good section in a lot of the book that mentioned throughout how distracted we are, and especially with social media and our phones and all the distractions we have coming at us constantly. And one of the tips it gave is it said, when you get to work, take your first 90 minutes and turn off your cell phone, turn off all notifications, go into a, a quiet place and focus not on the most pressing task of the day, but on the most life important or our valuable event of the day, our task of the day, 
right? The thing that's going to satisfy the long-term goal. And that's really at the heart of what you want to do. And work on, give your first 90 minutes of work to that. And then it talked about breaking up your day into kind of 60-minute segments where you focus really hard on something for an hour, take a break, and then go back and focus on something for another hour and really kind of let your, let your, your brain work hard and then rest it and then work it hard and rest it. And I've been trying some of that too, and it's actually helped my productivity. And so, right, there's – so – what will I say? What, what do I say about this book? Do I recommend 5 a.m. Club? I don't think I recommend it because it it's there's some amazing gems in the book, right? And the ones I talked about are the ones that I found most valuable and important. But because the book is so wrapped, and it this morning I was actually I was I was describing it to some people, and I was describing it to my wife Rachel. And I said, the, the thing about this book is it has all of this over-the-top positivity in it. Over, like, it's just like it's this self-help, you can do anything and just have to focus your mind on it. It's all about you and you just have to do it and you can do whatever you want and you can have all the wealth you want and right, every, everything and all this stuff that is just wrapped up in the myth of American exceptionalism and and the, 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 the lie of the American dream and all these things like that. And this book is absolutely espousing those things and it's all wrapped up in that. And this morning I, I Googled, because I was looking for the word to describe it. And I, I was Googling, you know, the, the, what's the problem with self-help books? And I found this article in Forbes. And I'm going to share the article with you. Uh, you can take a look at it. It's called The Psychologist Tells You Why You Need to Escape the Toxic World of Self-Help. And one of the paragraphs in this book said, when someone writes a self-help book, their goal is to sell as many to as many people as they can. So self-help content is often oversimplified and sweetened with a false sense of hope and meaninglessness um, uh, and meaningless pats on the back. This is why so many people feel they can relate to these books and feel happy while reading them. It's essentially toxic positivity. And toxic positivity had a hyperlink to it. And so I'm like, that's the word I was looking for. It's a toxic positivity. And so I followed the link and it brought me to another website called uh, Therapy Tips. And in this uh, in this link, a psychologist is being interviewed about what they called um, being toxically positive. And I said, that's what this book is. Because as I'm reading this book, right, and you know me, I I want to walk in beauty. I want to be a better person. I want to be a value member of the globe. I want to encourage and invite people to be the best that we can. I want to address the systemic and, and institutional challenges and problems that we have. And I want to make some changes at a foundational level. But as I'm reading through the 5 a.m. club, and basically it's saying, wake up in the morning, do these things, focus your attention, and you can do anything you want. And I, I, I said to people at numerous times throughout reading this book, I said, it feels like this book is written to white landowning men. Even though one of the characters is a woman, the, the entrepreneur in the book is a woman. I said, I feel like this book is written to white landowning men, telling them, all of the crap of white supremacy. You can do it yourself. You can handle this. You can, you just, all the world is, is your oyster and you just have to find your personal energy and you can have whatever you want. And it doesn't acknowledge for a moment the systemic institutional barriers that so many people have to go up against in order to succeed or to, or to, to do well in the, in the task and in the work that they're trying to do. And so as a, as a native man who is deeply knowledgeable and informed about the systemic inequalities of our country, as well as well-versed on the lies 
around the myth of American exceptionalism and the lie of white supremacy and how, right, this belief that the world is just this boundless uh, resource and you can you can have positive growth forever and we all can be billionaires. And it's like, no, that is such a load of crap. That's not possible. It's not possible. And yet that's what this entire book is wrapped in. And so I wanted to I want to share with you about this book because I found the most valuable thing about the book is it reminded me of the stuff I learned while living on the reservation. It reminded me and it gave me even a way to think about it, right? And I, I, I as while reading this book, I actually thought, what if I would have actually done what I should have done on the reservation, which is I should have run in the morning to greet the sunrise, right? It, we, the, the, the tradition is, is you wake up and you run to the east and you greet the sunrise with your prayers. The problem was, is where my Hogan was and my house was on the reservation, if I ran to the east, I would have run into a forest <laughs> or I would have run down a hill, right, away from the sunrise and towards a, a big cliff. And so it's like, um, it was like, yeah, I, it wasn't feasible to run. And so I would often just, I would stand outside or I would walk up a hill and there I would, I, so I, but, and so I thought if I would have just run and broke a sweat and then watched the sunrise Read it with my prayers, reflected on the day, given gratitude, all the stuff I've done. If I would have just added the, the, the running part of it into my tradition, I think I would have, I, right? And so what this book did is it reminded me of what my people have been doing for hundreds of years. And it, it challenged me of even though, okay, I can't get to the sunrise every morning because of my commitment to my family. I, I am waking up. I am, I am exercising vigorously. I'm breaking a sweat, and then I'm journaling. I'm thinking through my day. I'm giving gratitude. I'm, I'm, I'm being in a place of thankfulness. And then I am. I'm trying to have less distraction throughout the day. I'm enjoying the curiosity and the, 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 the act of learning new things. And I'm trying to to minimize my distractions when I'm working throughout the day. And it's having some really, really beneficial impacts on my productivity right now. And it's not because of what the spellbinder passed down to the billionaire who wrote a cheesy story to help an entrepreneur and artist become the most successful people they could ever want to become, right? That, that's, that's the crap. But there were a few things that reminded me of stuff I actually already knew. And it, it helped me to, to put those things in an order and to, and to focus on them in a way I hadn't quite done before. And I wish I had. I, I actually should have. And so for me, it was, a really, it was really valuable. But I would be so hesitant to fully recommend this book because of all of the the the. the, the the lies that it's wrapped in, right? And and just the, the promise of you can do whatever you want and you can you can become as wealthy as you imagine and right, there's all this success just waiting for you. And it's like, yeah, this book, we don't need more of us thinking like white landowning men, right? That's one of the reasons we're facing the global crises that we're facing because white landowning men are treating this world like it's an endless abundance of resources and things aren't limited and we don't need to live here sustainably. And so anyway, so anyway, <laughs> I could go on and on and on. But so I, I hope this is helpful. I I don't want to completely dismiss the whole self-help industry, um, but I want to warn you about the toxic positivity that it espouses. Um, and I want to encourage you to continue. Don't look for a single book or guru who's going to teach you everything, right? We're all, we're, 
we're all on a journey. We're trying to understand things and make sense of things. And we're all trying to, to improve ourselves and we can help each other along the way. Um, but if you fall into the, the pit, the minutia of the toxic positivity from the self-help groups, you're going to be, you're going to find yourself striving for things that are not actually beneficial for our global community. And you're being told things that are just not true. So anyway, I welcome your feedback on this. I hope these things have been helpful. Let me go back and look through some of the comments here. I see Susan is on. Yat A, Susan, thanks for joining this morning. Um, Jordan, Yat A, thanks for joining from Utah. Glad you could be here. I actually, when I'm working in the morning, when, I, when I'm doing my workout, I'm on my elliptical. And what I do is I have my headphones on and I'm listening to some workout music. So I'm listening to more vigorous music. Um, but I, on my, on uh, my elliptical is right in front of our television. And so I, I have a YouTube channel up and I've been watching videos of scenic videos. And yesterday, Jordan, I watched the video I watched was one of scenery, uh, scenery from Utah. And it was just, it was just, just beautiful. The mountains and the valleys and the rivers and the, the red rocks and right. This, uh, oh, just, yeah. So anyway, I, I appreciate you joining me from Utah. I, I was watching the scenery of your of the state you're in um, with uh, MV yesterday because I love the Southwest and I love being back in that area. So thanks for joining this morning. Uh, who else is on here? Let's see. Uh, Havenly Scott, uh, thanks for joining this morning. It's good to have you on. I appreciate you. Um, being here and yeah, the, your comment here, so much of self-help can be about ideas uh, that who you are as a person is a product, our brand, and it isn't. It's also littered with the idea that you can bypass your way to success. Yeah, there, there's so many things that toxic positivity that exists in self-help can really be detrimental to the goals we're working on. And so we, we really need to find a way to, to, to focus on those things better. But um, anyway, my relatives... I appreciate you. Thank you for taking time to join me for my second cup of coffee. I hope this is helpful. Oh, I wanted to share one last thing with you. I actually wanted to share because I, 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 I said before, I love to share. I'm a foodie at heart and I, I'm, I'm taking, I take a lot of photos and there's a few photos I took these past few days of um, some some foodie photos that I want to share with you. The first was just dinner last night. Um, we made, I made omelets for my family and some homemade tortillas. And so that's my omelet with, uh, it has egg and sausage and tomato and broccoli and onion and mushroom and green chili and um, a lot of other vegetables and then cheese and of course the egg. And it was a really a good meal. But I wanted to share these photos with you because my daughter is in a Latin class. She takes Latin in her high school. And all the language classes had a potluck yesterday. And they had to bring a dish from the tradition of the language, the culture of the language they're speaking. So right, if you're speaking Spanish, you brought something um, a Mexican dish or a Spanish dish. If you if you're learning German or you're learning um, France, you brought foods from those countries. <laughs> so my daughter is learning Latin, and she's like, "What do I do for my recipe?" And so her whole class was doing that. And so she did some research on Latin recipes, right? And so Latin is a dead language; no one speaks it right now. I mean, they still do some things in the Catholic Church in Latin. And so she she did some research and she found this website. I'm going to share it with you. Um, it's called those. What I showed you are called globbies. And the, the, the recipe is um, about the Roman sweet. It, it comes from Cato the Elder, who lived in the second and third centuries, I believe. And the recipe is literally for those globbies. Let me show you those pictures again. The recipe is literally ricotta cheese, which apparently goes back um, thousands of years. The modern version of ricotta cheese, it was was more from like the the a few hundred years ago, but there there's an older version of ricotta cheese that goes back thousands of years. And so it's ricotta cheese 
and flour, wheat flour and honey. And you mix the ricotta cheese with the flour and some water and our, you mix the ricotta cheese with the flour and you make this dough. You roll the dough into balls about one inch in diameter or one inch around. And then you f deep fry them in, and we, we deep fried them in a cast iron skillet. And, uh, and then you top them with honey and with poppy seeds. And they actually didn't look bad, right? If you look at them, they don't look bad. They look fairly appetizing. But <laughs> my daughter's comment after we ate them, because they're very bland, right? It, it's, you don't even mix honey into the dough. You top it with honey. Um, and so the, the dough is just cheese and wheat flour. There's no salt. There's no, there's no other seasoning that's in it. And then you sprinkle poppy seeds on top and you, and you um, kind of uh, put some honey around it. And so there's a little bit of sweetness, but mostly it's, it's a flavorless kind of ball of dough. And my daughter tasted it. She said, oh, this is, she said, this is not good. She says, now I understand why the spice trade was so important, right? Because literally this, this, this recipe came from Cato the Elder which was back in the second and third centuries, I believe. And so this is, this is literally kind of the food that could have been eaten um, back in ancient Rome. And so it was really fun to make it. I helped my daughter make it. She did almost all the work. I was just there to help supervise working with the hot oil. But we had a fun time. We did that on Sunday afternoon. And then she brought it to her school potluck yesterday. And the feedback she got from the students was the same feedback she had, which is they look better than they taste. So I actually may want to try it again sometime and, and just see uh, what happens to the recipe if you mix the honey with the the cheese and the flour so you actually add some sweetness into the dough instead of just covering it with the honey so the dough actually has some more flavor and some sweetness so i may actually try to make it again my daughter's like i don't want to make these ever again but i'm like i may try them again sometime it's a fairly simple recipe to make and yeah i shared the link there so um you can try it. I'm sure there's a way to make it better. Um, one of her classmates said they made something that had sugar in it. And I said, I, did they have sugar then? And actually the Roman empire was fairly sugar free. And so they had things like honey, but they didn't have granulated sugar or, you know, kind of the, the modern, the sugar that was in other parts of the world. And so anyway, that was something fun. We did, uh, we made globby. Uh, which again is a Latin word, which means sphere or globe. <laughs> and so um, it was a fun thing to try, good fun thing to do with my daughter. But anyway, my relatives, I hope your second cup of coffee is as good as mine. I hope this discussion on self-help and toxic positivity, as well as just some things that I was able to learn and be reminded of about what we can do to be more productive is helpful. And the goal of all this, right, is to walk in beauty. So walk in beauty, my relatives. And may we all learn how to walk in beauty together. Ashihat and hakonet.